Okay, today I'm going to read the introduction to Edward Land Terry's book, Modeling and Sculpting the Human Figure. And this is a book that I've done a video on um, in the past, and I, I think I proclaimed it the best sculpture book available. And it has three introductions. So make sure you skip to the third introduction, which is the one written by Lanteri. And this is something that I have sometimes read to my students before we start class um, to try to set the tone for them as, as students and also for me as a teacher. Um, <clears throat> I'm about to teach a class next week, so trying to get in the mood to teach again. You know, it's kind of a serious business, and um, this introduction is just about that. So, I'll read it. It's only three pages, and then I'll try to give a little bit of commentary as to what I think it means. And this was written in 1902, so it is 120 years old, but I think it's evergreen. I think it... Um, you know, I think what, what he says is uh, timeless. Anyway, here we go. I have repeatedly been asked to publish the notes of which I made use for my demonstration classes at the Royal College of Art. I fancy that by somewhat developing them, they will be found useful by those who intend to devote themselves to this art, as well as by those who undertake the task of instructing beginners in the subject. I do not pretend to think that my method is the only right one. There is no such thing as an, as an infallible method. Every intelligent teacher must be free to form his own on condition that he bases it on true principles. Thus, instead of exclusively setting forth one method, even if it be the very best, it is better to state broadly the great essential principles of teaching in which every method ought to be included and to allow the teacher a certain latitude. So um, he's admitting that, that every method of teaching is fallible. You could argue that because they're man-made, they're fallible. And um, he wants every teacher to, to not just uh, parrot what, what their mentor taught them, <clears throat> but to develop their own way of teaching. And, you know, I, I have a lot of reverence for my mentors. I quote them constantly when I teach. But I think ultimately, you know, I'm, I'm giving my students um, my version of it. And, um, and the way I teach is evolving over the years. So he's saying... It's fine to have your own method as long as it's grounded in the great essential principles of teaching. And that's really important, and we're, we'll get back to that. Um, he's saying that every method should be included um, in your method. And that's a lot to, to chew on. Uh, but I think, you know, you can, learn, you can learn something from every art book. Uh, while they're not all created equal, I think you can learn something from everyone's method and really, you know, it's best to take the best of the best and put it together. It is important that everyone should bring to the adopted method such modifications as will allow him to consider it his very own personal method. It is only thus that he will find the impulse and devotion necessary for the accomplishment of his arduous task. So he's saying, Teaching is an arduous task, and if you don't develop your own method, then you're not going to have the um, impulse or devotion necessary to, to accomplish teaching. So if you don't have your own method, you're not going to have the passion, and you're not going to have the devotion. I think that's, that's really a, a good point. The auxiliary means of teaching have not an absolute value in themselves. They may prove useful or dangerous according to the moment and measure of their application. Um, 
this is interesting. He's saying that, you know, teaching within itself is not valuable. Um, you can teach people horrible things. You know, you look back in history and you see all the, um, all the evil things that have been taught and all the destruction it led to. So he's, that's an extreme example. He's saying in art teaching, <clears throat> you know, if, if, um, if, if the knowledge is placed at the wrong time and the wrong size of information, then that can be dangerous. Um, it reminds me of a quote that, I'm gonna paraphrase it, that, you know, a little bit of knowledge is a, can be a dangerous thing. It reminds me of that. So your, um, you know, dropping knowledge on someone has to be done at the right time and it has to be the, the, the right nugget of information. Otherwise, it could be dangerous. In order to prove efficacious, they must be presented in methodical order. This order can only be settled after precisely ascertaining the object in view and the principles on which the means for obtaining this object should be based. So, methodical order. Um, it reminds me of my teacher, Cedric Egley, would uh, oftentimes call it a sequence a sequence of thinking and a sequence of doing. And um, if things are out of sequence, uh, it can be dangerous or unuseful or confusing. So for instance, if a new, a new newbie and a, you know, a beginning student doesn't know the first thing about, about uh, the action of the pose or proportions, well, it makes no sense to teach them, let's say the anatomy of the shoulder because they're not ready for that. So it has to be in a, what he calls methodical order and what Cedric called a sequence. All right, he goes on to say, art is essentially individual. In fact, individuality makes the artist. I love that. I'm not gonna argue with that. All teaching to be true and rational must aim at preserving, developing, and perfecting the individual sentiment of the artist. So, like I said, this was written 120 years ago, and I think there's a, there's a cartoonish misconception that that old knowledge um, is a ball and chain on creativity, that you know, it can hold us back from our expression. But, you know, he's saying the exact opposite. He's saying that you know, the nourishment of the individual um, sentiment of the artist is paramount. So it's all about the individual. Therefore, the end at which every teacher should aim, whose task it is to teach the fine arts, is the development of the artistic aptitude of each pupil. The best means and exercises are those which tend mostly, most surely to attain this end. In thoroughly teaching each pupil the craft, not to say trade of a sculptor, there is no fear of destroying his individuality. On the contrary, having conscientiously learnt the craft, he will gain confidence and the necessary power to express truthfully the personal sentiment with which nature has endowed him. Whilst if the teacher wants to go further than this, he risks imposing on the student his own way of looking at things and destroying the pupil's individuality. So um, he's saying that, that the knowledge, learning the craft, you know, this is not something that holds you back. This is something that empowers you uh, to express your own personal sentiment. So we all have a reason, excuse me, <laughs> we all have a reason why we're artists. And, you know, your reason is a little bit different than my reason. You know, the re why did you start drawing as a kid? Why do you have the impulse to want to perfect things or, or right certain wrongs? You know, we all have some kind of impetus. And, um, you know, or natural abilities combined with that. So he's saying that, um, 
you know, as a teacher, you don't want to destroy that. You um, want to preserve and, um, you know, nourish that. <clears throat> okay, here he goes. This short attempt of mine has no other object than to place before the student some practical hints. So he's call, he did this 300-page book, or about, I don't know how, how big it is. Uh, he's calling it a short attempt to give practical hints. <laughs> so there's a lot of humility in Lanteri, and I, I feel that he has such reverence for, for the great artists of the past, and I think that's... That's a quality that, that every fine artist should have. No matter how great you are, um, your knowledge is the result of centuries of, of um, you know, artists being built on the shoulders of other artists. So you're not born in a vacuum. And I think there was this thing, especially in the 20th century, when a lot of this knowledge was almost destroyed. You know, you had a lot of these... Uh, self you know proclaimed self-taught artists that was the thing you know oh I'm, he or she is self-taught and um even if you didn't have any formal training you're not really self-taught because there's so much knowledge out there in books and and video and on television i mean it's just it's kind of a um i don't know a narcissistic thing to say i think um so he's saying this book is a guide. When he has mastered this method, he will come to apply it without thinking of it, instinctively as it were, and without effort. The application of this method will have caused him to fix the points of construction precisely. He will have made a complete analysis of the human figure. All the cases and reasons of its various forms will be clear to him and he will avoid that groping in the dark, those unreasoning alterations, which are always tried when this branch of the instruction has been neglected. Okay, that's kind of a lot to, to, to uh, digest. Uh, he's, he's saying when you master these principles of the human body and nature, how it's fit together, you will apply it without thinking of it. And this reminds me of another concept called the secret figure. And secret figure... I believe came out of the French Academy. It was this notion that when you're not just copying reality, but you're memorizing a universal um, human being in your in your brain, you uh, you have this this downloaded blueprint in your brain of how a body is fit together, how it's constructed, and when you go to the live model or your portrait client, you are seeing how your your subject fits into that universal figure or deviates from it slightly and in other words you're not reinventing the wheel each time you try to draw a person so i think that's really important also at the end of the paragraph he says this will allow you to avoid groping in the dark or doing unreasoning alterations and this is so true i mean groping in the dark is a great way to put it because we've all done it and we've seen our students do it. It's where the artist doesn't know how to fix the problem, but um, out of sheer will or um, want to, to look like they're, they're doing the right thing, they soldier on. And my, my teacher, Cedric, always called it soldiering. He's, he'd say, don't soldier, you know. Back then, everyone had to do... Um, some military service. So he had been in the army and I think maybe that's where he got that, that expression, but uh, you don't want a soldier. You don't want to grope in the dark blindly, hoping it's all going to work out because most of the time it doesn't, it doesn't work out. Maybe you get lucky once in a while, but um, if you don't know what to do and your, your painting or sculpture is going downhill, I think it's best to just stop take a break, you know, pull out this book or another book like it. Um, look at, look at something that inspires you. Um, look at the great artists of the past. You'll see that they went through the exact same troubles you went, you're now going through. And, um, if you don't know what to do, it's best not to do anything most of the time. 
until you have a plan. Okay, so, so don't soldier. This book contains in short limits the essence of the subject. It is, so to speak, the summary of a method, a sort of guide which gives the, the primary indications of the way. So again, a, a three-part volume, it's very thorough, and he's just calling it a sort of guide which gives the primary indications of the way. So as a teacher, he's, he's, um, he's not saying, you know, be a disciple of me. He's saying, I'm presenting the, um, what does he call it? The essence of the subject, the summary of a method. And it's a guide or, you know, it's helpful hints that are going to allow you as the individual to, to do your thing. I must insist again and again on this point that the aim of art teaching should be to put within the pupil's grasp all that is necessary to help him to express his thoughts by the simplest, surest, and quickest means. This is really, really important. Um, I think most contemporary realists today would agree that we want the surest means, meaning like the most accurate um, statements in drawing or sculpture. Now, simplest and quickest, I think that's something that's lost today. And this might be, um, I don't know, maybe the influence of the camera or, or film or whatever, but people aren't doing things the simplest and quickest way anymore, a lot of them. And, um, you know, one method that comes to mind is you know, if you're just doing sight size or, you know, you're just copying angles constantly or, you know, you're doing a sculpture, but you're just tracing the silhouette and then you're putting little balls of clay until you arrive at the form. I mean, these methods just seem, there's some value in that, but it's not practical for a working artist who's doing portraits in real life. Um, that's fine if you're just going to exist in the atelier world, but if you want to be out in the real world in uncontrolled environments painting all kinds of people, not professional models, but real people, kids, you know, try sculpting a kid's head, um, tracing the silhouette. It's not going to work. Um, you know, try doing um, sight size with, with a toddler. It's not going to work. So you want to do it, do it the simplest way, meaning start from big to small, and that that's, gets back to the sequence. And the quickest way, um, there's no sense in, in spending two weeks on a little, little shadow pattern with a, with a pencil. Just take vine charcoal, make the shape, you know? Do it in, do it in five seconds. I'm not saying it has to be arbitrary, you can still study it and be sure, but doing it the most streamlined way possible is going to make the most beautiful result. That's my, that's my philosophy and, and opinion on that. And I think it was also Lanteri's and, and most of the old masters, I think, would, would feel that way. I can't say for sure, but I think so. It shouldn't particular sharpen his observation without too much influencing his own judgment. And when the student's judgment goes astray, he should be corrected by model or example placed before him without his perceiving the intention for fear of making him lose his own power of judging. So this is a little more advanced. He's saying that, you know, the student should be corrected when they're messing up um, by model or example, so I guess by by showing on the model or the plaster cast or maybe the teacher's drawing something on the side of the page. And, and this has to be placed before the student without the student perceiving the intention. So you have to correct your student with the, let's say, instead of just er erasing the, the drawing and redoing it and saying, oh, I'm a great teacher, um, you have to give them the answer in an idea form. Give them the roadmap 
to the truth, not not just um, not just canceling out their attempt and putting in yours. And I think, you know, as wonderful as George Bridgman was, if you look at his students' drawings from the Art Students League, you'll see that they look like Bridgman drawings. And, and he was known for um, wiping out their drawing and just redrawing it. And, um, you know, I think sometimes that, that can be helpful, but um, what did he really accomplish? Did he, did he really, change the mind of the student? Did, did he uh, give them an aha moment? I don't think so. You know, I think it's better if, you know, if you're gonna teach art, fine art, you have to live in the world of ideas and you have to place an idea or a concept in front of the student that is timely and not too complicated, just enough for them at that time. Okay, it's almost over. And as drawing is the principal foundation of sculpture, and a good sculptural work depends largely on good drawing, the student should draw as much as, if not more than, a student of painting, which unfortunately is not always done. I can say this is definitely true. Um, I have many sculpture students that don't draw very much or don't draw at all. Um, and many of them have never painted in oils. So uh, many times I get to a point in a student's development where they're pretty good in a linear sense or with small forms, but they don't really have the big massing of the planes or the, you know, the shadow shapes in a simple, quick way. And that's where I ask them, hey, have you ever painted before? Because what's coming to my mind is, think like a painter now, put the big forms in, uh, and a lot of times they say no, and that's that's kind of where I have an aha moment going, oh, well, no wonder you don't know <laughs> how to think about massing in a big way. So that's where I, I would advocate go paint. So draw, draw, draw. No student ought to be admitted to modeling, modeling means sculpting, in a school, unless he has first done some serious drawing. And on this understanding, I begin this guide, always addressing myself to a student who is capable of seeing a line and executing it properly. So he's, he's sort of um, writing this book for the student um, who's already has, can already draw somewhat. That's, that's part of his, uh, his caveat here. Another important point on which I must insist is the thorough study of artistic anatomy. You must begin your work with some knowledge of the form of the bones and muscles and go on with the study of it while at work. I shall point out to you in the following pages what is necessary for you to study, but I can, of course, only slightly indicate it to you, leaving you to complete your knowledge from the actual skeleton, the anatomical figure, and the excellent books written on the subject of artistic anatomy by the late Professor Marshall, Professor Arthur Thompson, who, by the way, is a great, great book himself. Mr. J. Sparks, I don't know who that is. I, I want to know, and others. And I would add to this Dr. Paul Roche, who was a contemporary of uh, Lanteri. I think a little younger than Lanteri. I beg you to observe that the knowledge of the bones is even more important than that of the muscular system. Do not lose sight of that fact. Um, yeah, that's really important. So, so the, the, the skeleton is the, the superstructure that dictates everything, you know, regarding the soft forms of the body, the, the muscles, the, the tendons, the ligaments, the fat pads, the skin, everything is kind of hanging on this endoskeleton, uh, superstructure, I like to call it. Um, he says, do not lose sight of the fact that, quote, anatomy teaches you the general laws of the human form, whilst the living model shows you the same laws applied and modified by individual characteristics. So he's saying you can't just study anatomy, you have to study the live model and see how it manifests and see how the, 
the anatomy is applied and modified by individual characteristics. So he's getting back to the, the individual, um, not just in the, the student, but in the teacher's method and also in the model.